So, a few little facts about Archbishop Lurie. Uh He was ordained in uh, May of 1977. That's uh, how long he has been a priest. Uh, his first assignment was at uh, St. Joseph's in Landover, Maryland. So he has roots in, uh, in Maryland here. And um, he is uh, currently, obviously, the Archbishop of our, our diocese. But uh, before that, uh, he was auxiliary, served as auxiliary bishop in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, I believe from 95 to 2001, and from 2001 up until now, was the Bishop of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, he is on the Board of Pro-Life Activities and the Committee of the Doctrine of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Last year, he was appointed as head of the U.S. Conference Catholic uh, uh, Bishop Ad Hoc Committee for Religious Freedom to seek congressional action against the HHS mandate, which uh, mandates that all Catholic institutions, including hospitals, universities, and charities, offer their employees health coverage that includes sterilization, abortion-inducing drugs, and contraception. So that's a little bit of our wonderful Archbishop. Let's give him a hand and welcome him. Hey, thank you, Rod. Nice to be here at the Improv. <laughs> I really uh, thought, what, what, what a great night to come to the Green Turtle uh, and to do the town hall format, you know? <laughs> I think so. Nothing like a little retail theology, so here we are. Great to be with everybody uh, tonight. And uh, I, just to say something, to pick up on something that, that Rod said, uh, seeing you here um, does my heart a lot of good. Seeing young people, young adults, um, opening their hearts up to Christ and to the church and to the truth and seeking to live that truth um, today in the context of our times, what a great, great encouragement for me. So I just want to begin by saying thank you very much with all my heart. And uh, you can clap for yourselves if you'd like. I feel like I'm at the Dominican House of Studies, though. <laughs> Where they are, wow, it's pretty good. Rod mentioned that we're um, beginning the year of faith. Um, what a great Holy Father we have in Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. And I would just want to say this to you. This isn't just um, a program he's doing. He didn't just get up one day and say, I think we need a year of faith. I think that his whole life as a priest, as a theologian, and as a bishop, uh, and now as our Holy Father, has been leading up to this because this is what he regards, I think I'm very confident in saying this, as most important, the new evangelization. Reproposing the faith in a convincing way to the culture of today. And this is so important because um, you understand things and experience things about this culture that an old fossil like me probably doesn't. And that is why when young people open their hearts, your hearts, uh, to Christ and to the church, it is so important. So we might, I might add this. Um, I think I was very blessed by the good Lord to be sent to Baltimore in the first place. I'd just like to say, for me, coming back to Maryland and coming to the nation's oldest archdiocese, um, what a blessing it is. I just want you to know I'm really happy to be here. And let me just say that coming during the year of faith is a great thing. Because as I see it, um, the year of faith is not just something I'm going to do for one year. 
the new evangelization is not just a program we're going to cook up and think about it for a year, year and a half, and then say, well, we did that. Pope Paul VI, way back in 1974, said that evangelization, that is to say, communicating the gospel effectively in the context of our times, is not just something that the church does. It's not just one activity among many. It is rather, he said, the church's deepest identity. The church exists to transmit the gospel. That's what the Lord said to the apostles, to go out and preach the good news to all the nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The great drama of our times is the increasing split, the divorce, the great divorce, as C.S. Lewis might say, between gospel and culture. A lot of people might tell you they're atheists, but if you kind of dig a little deeper, they're not really atheists. They don't really think that God doesn't exist. But they might think God is irrelevant to their lives. They might think of God as a sort of a, a distant uncle that maybe on a rare occasion visits and occasionally might send a birthday gift, but has really nothing to do with what daily life is like, what truth is, what value should be, and really what the direction and meaning of our life should be. And so consequently, in our times, and I've lived to see this, there has been an increasingly more aggressive secularism that has sort of swept over our culture. Our challenges, with regard to religious liberty are not in the first instance judicial or legislative or administrative. They're really challenges that arise from a secular culture which at best is indifferent to God and at worst is hostile to God, the things of God, religious people, and religious institutions. And so what's, what's the task for us? I'd say there are three tasks when you boil it all down that the Holy Father's calling us to do. Number one, he says, believing is not just intellectually saying, yes, the teaching of the church is true. That's very important. And I would never minimize that in a room full of Dominicans. I'd probably be shocked. <laughs> But that intellectual ascent is leading somewhere. It's leading to really doing what Pope Benedict says faith is. It's standing with Christ. It's choosing to stand with Christ so that we can live our lives in, through, and with Christ. And you know, the more we open our mind and heart to the person of Christ, the more the teachings of the church, including those very countercultural moral teachings of the church, begin to make sense. An act of faith goes something like this. Let it be done to me according to thy word. I think that's what the Blessed Mother, that was her big act of faith when she was told she was to be the mother of the Savior. That's the kind of act of faith we have to be. Second, if we find in the grace of the Holy Spirit the ability to entrust ourselves to God intellectually, morally, spiritually, and bodily, then we will also find ourselves convinced, convinced in the most beautiful, peaceful, and persistent way about the truth, the beauty, the coherence, and the goodness of what the church believes and teaches, and we'll find ourselves equipping ourselves uh, to be able to 
propose what the church believes and teaches to our contemporaries with conviction and confidence. We will be able to speak confidently about those teachings because at this very moment when we're speaking about them, they're shaping us. We are not just proponents, but witnesses. And number three, courage. The new evangelization takes a lot of courage. You probably know this. Uh, you've probably been in that crowd where you felt like you were the only one thinking that X, Y, or Z that's been proposed isn't the way to go. And you know to put your hand up and stand up and be a sign of contradiction, however reasonable and loving you may be, takes a lot of guts, a lot of courage. New evangelization takes that too. Um, I think that's what we're being called to in this year of faith. And I think that's what I'm going to dedicate my ministry to as the Archbishop of Baltimore. I've heard it said of one bishop that it was one of the many commentators out there, and you know there's commentators out there, and he said, Bishop X belongs to the evangelical wing of the Catholic Church in North America. What evangelical wing? The whole darn thing is evangelical. That's why we exist. So, and that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, as you come up to the microphone and play Stump the Archbishop, which won't be too hard to do, <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, we'll come together as Archbishop and as the great young people of this Archdiocese as co-workers, or as our Pope would say, cooperators in the truth. Thanks, everybody. God bless each and every one of you.